Blame on both sides? I have no doubt about it. The fallout continues over the president's comments at Trump Tower about the violence in Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's a runoff. Two Republicans move on in the race to fill a Senate seat in Alabama. And the White House promises more action on Iraq. Hear what they plan for Christians who have been persecuted. And helping our neighbor, how one humanitarian group and family assists the people of Myanmar, Iraq, and Sudan. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, August 16th, 2017. I was blind, but now I see. Mourners filled the Paramount Theater in Charlottesville, Virginia to remember Heather Heyer. Thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The 32-year-old was killed when a car slammed into a group of protesters at a white nationalist rally Saturday. At the public memorial service, her mother received a standing ovation when speaking about Heyer's desire for equality. They tried to kill my child to shut her up. Well, guess what? You just magnified her. Heyer worked as a paralegal in Charlottesville. Her main duty was helping low-income clients file for bankruptcy. The memorial service comes as fallout continues from President Trump's defiant press conference at Trump Tower yesterday. The president defended his response to the violence, saying both sides are at fault. There's blame, yes. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at, you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. At the press conference, the president did condemn several groups directly for the Charlottesville attack, but doubled down on his original remarks. Many leaders across the country are now planning to wipe away imagery of the Old South, which is seen by some as racist. Cities have already started removing Confederate monu monuments from public property. Correspondent Mark Irons reports from the White House on an ongoing controversy, which has gained the president's attention. Mark. Good evening, Lauren. The president says people who remove these monuments are changing history and culture. In that heated press conference, he condemned the violence of white nationalists and neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, but said some people there were not associated with the hate groups and only wanted to protest the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee. All right, now. Can everybody clear out for me, please? Thank you. Baltimore removes four Confederate statues early this morning. Just two days earlier, Robert E. Lee came toppling down in Durham, North Carolina. We're the people of Durham, and we don't like that this statue was put here, you know? But some people disagree. I think it's terrible. I don't think they should have done that. This week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week, and is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? The president noting that Washington and Jefferson, both with monuments in D.C., owned slaves. What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. You're changing history. You're changing culture. Trump says the decision to remove statues should be up to the local community or federal government, depending on where the monuments are located. In Gainesville, Florida, they've decided it's goodbye to Old Joe, a monument to fallen Confederate soldiers. And in Dallas, Texas, the mayor is asking the city council to consider the fate of these statues. As I expressed before, I think they are dangerous totems in our Dallas society because they divide us versus unite us. The Daughters of the Confederacy own this statue in Alexandria, Virginia. The city council voted unanimously to remove it, but two state laws won't let that happen. It doesn't have a name, it's an unnamed soldier, and it was erected in the 1800s, so I definitely understand that the historical aspect that this particular statue might have. Inside the U.S. Capitol building, there are Confederate statues, and they can also be found in Washington's Episcopal National Cathedral. A Protestant bishop there says Confederate monuments either need to be removed or contextualized, calling them rallying sites for racial hatred. Lauren. 
Mark, after some members of the president's business councils quit yesterday, the president today decided to disband them. What can you tell us about that? Several CEOs left positions on the president's manufacturing council and his policy forum. They were not pleased with the president's remarks regarding the Charlottesville protests, so they resigned. The president says rather than put pressure on business people, he is ending both of these councils. Correspondent Mark Irons at the White House. Thank you, Mark. As North Korea backs off on plans to launch missiles toward Guam, President Trump praises the dictator's restraint. He writes, Kim Jong-un of North Korea made a very wise and well-reasoned decision. The alternative would have been both catastrophic and unacceptable. A judge who lost his job defending traditional marriage and the Ten Commandments wins the first round of voting for Alabama's Senate seat. Next month's Republican runoff will shine a light on what kind of candidate conservatives want. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi says voters must choose between an outsider and an incumbent backed by party leaders. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. It's just one Senate race here, but it has national implications. A Republican pollster, Greg Strimple, says the takeaway of last night's race is that Washington is very unpopular. Voters just want change. The one who gained the early lead in Alabama promises to buck the status quo here in Washington. Roy Moore not only rides a horse to vote, but also a tide of anti-Washington sentiment. He wins the first round of voting for an Alabama Senate seat. The attempt by the silk stocking Washington elitist to control the vote of the people of Alabama has failed. Moore will face incumbent Senator Luther Strange in a September 26 runoff Republican primary. President Trump is taking some of the credit, tweeting, Wow, Senator Luther Strange picked up a lot of additional support since my endorsement. Now in September runoff, strong on wall and crime. In a state where President Trump remains deeply popular, the top candidates all tried to show they were closer to him. I think the president's role will be very important in my campaign because we've got uh, to, and people in Alabama anyway, have voted to uh, support the president and his agenda. They want to see concrete, conservative things done that affect their lives. Senator Strange is also getting millions of dollars in support from a group linked to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. When Barack Obama launched an assault on our religious freedoms, Big Luther Strange said no way. But this help could cost Strange support if Moore convinces voters the race is a referendum against Senate leadership. They want them to stop playing games with the people of Alabama and with the people of America. Moore can point to his defense of traditional marriage and the Ten Commandments, which twice cost him his job as Alabama Chief Justice. We need to go back to recognition that God's hand is still on this country and on this campaign. Judge Moore still faces an uphill battle. He has a loyal following among evangelicals, but Republicans who voted for other candidates on the ballot yesterday may line up behind Senator Strange now that it's just a two-man race. Strange, like Moore, is promising to fight for traditional marriage, the unborn, and religious freedom. The winner will face Democratic nominee Doug Jones in December. Lauren? Correspondent Jason Calvey at the Capitol. Thank you, Jason. A Utah mayor overcomes nearly $1 million in a tax to win a three-way Republican primary in a race to fill a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, vacated by Jason Chaifetz. Provo Mayor John Curtis is now on an easy path toward victory in November's election. Republicans outnumber Democrats 5 to 1 in Utah's 3rd Congressional District. Representative Chris Smith, a Republican from New Jersey, is praising a new report out of the State Department and calling for action. The report says ISIS is responsible for a genocide against Christians and other religious minorities in the Middle East. Smith says, quote, the report is an important tool in identifying problems worldwide, but it is just a start. We must take action on what is found in the report. Representative Smith is urging the Senate to pass a bill he sponsored to help victims of genocide in Iraq and Syria. The House passed it this past June. Joining us from the White House is Helen Furay, White House Director of Media Affairs. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for the invitation. Glad to be here with you. Now that the State Department has clearly identified ISIS as responsible for genocide against Christians, what is the Trump administration going to do about it? 
Well, this is an important issue for the Trump administration. If you don't have religious freedom, you're not going to have any of the other freedoms. And religious freedom in particular is one that truly identifies the individual. And we're here to support all individuals. And no one should be denied the opportunity or live in fear because of their beliefs, because of their faith. So when you look at what has happened, and it's so well documented in the case of ISIS and their genocide against the Yazidis, Muslim Christians. There are so many in areas that they have occupied or formerly occupied. It is so very clear that as an international community, we have to work together to ensure that the most vulnerable amongst us are absolutely safe. Well, and know, these includes the Christians in the Middle East. Right now, Christian families in Iraq are trying to resettle back into their homes in the Nineveh Plain, as I saw firsthand on my trip in April. The humanitarian portion of aid from the UN does not go directly to Christians, and I witnessed it falls on the Knights of Columbus and aid to the church in need and Archbishop Warda of Erbil to get those funds. How can the Trump administration help these homeless Christians? Well, providing safe haven and the humanitarian aid that that requires is an immediate priority of this administration. And the president has been very clear from the very beginning that this was a priority. People don't leave their homes voluntarily. They're forced to flee. And when they return, it also helps build a nation. And that's built on the fundamental belief that an individual will be respected and that their religious beliefs and all human rights will be respected. But that requires that we also provide that particularly that you're identifying the need for humanitarian aid to get to all communities, but particularly those who have been victims of genocide receive the aid and the relief that they need. It's important to reestablish democracy and balance in the Middle East. Of course, you know, some people are saying that Iraq has just forgotten with all of the other crises around the world. But it is also said that Christians in the Middle East, in Iraq, are very important and part of a very important mission to peace in the region. So what does the administration see as the correct strategy? So the correct strategy is going to be to, number one, work with our international partners, specifically the United Nations, amongst others, in order to provide um, the, the material aid that these communities need to really have a true safe haven and to be able to rebuild, which is so important. And there's no question about it that the Christian communities and the president's been forthright and he's been one of the very few international leaders to speak so clearly about how Christians in the Middle East, in Iraq and in other countries have been totally victimized and ignored. Well, this administration is not ignoring the Christian community. To the contrary, it is providing great support. And religious liberty, whether here or abroad, is an important component of our policies yes. that we have to provide support for. Helen Ferre, thank you so much for joining us. White House Director of Media Affairs. Thank you for the invitation. Glad to be with you. Thousands of Iraqis are fleeing an ISIS stronghold west of Mosul as coalition forces step up strikes ahead of a push to drive the militants out of the country forever. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the Pentagon with an update on the fight. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Iraqi and coalition forces have their sights set on defeating ISIS in one of their last strongholds in the country. It's a town called Talafar, which is less than 100 miles from the Syrian border. Iraqi police are on their way to Talafar. The town, located west of Mosul, is one of the last places in Iraq held by ISIS. Victory was declared against the militants in Mosul in July. But this last effort to oust the terror group is taking its toll on innocent Iraqis. Just this week, hundreds of exhausted civilians fled to a camp just west of Mosul. This man says he hasn't eaten for three days. He says everyone living on the outskirts of the town had to leave. There was no money, no food. Humanitarian workers say some of these families had to trek 10 plus hours to reach resting points. According to the UN, 49,000 people have fled the area since April, compounding the crisis. Iraqi and coalition forces are targeting ISIS tunnels and arsenals in and around the city to avoid hurting civilians. Today I asked coalition spokesperson Colonel Ryan Dillon why the town of Talafar is so critical. Any stronghold that is left 
in Iraq, which is less than a handful now, uh, where ISIS is, we are going to continue and, and work with the Iraqi security forces to defeat ISIS. Iraqi forces are not expected to push into the town for another few weeks. Iraq is asking the U.N. Security Council for assistance in collecting evidence to prosecute ISIS extremists for possible crimes against humanity. Lauren? Wyatt, I understand we had an update on the push to retake ISIS headquarters in Raqqa, Syria? That's right, Lauren. Colonel Dillon says U.S.-backed forces have pushed ISIS back a little over three miles from last week. That's a group they're pushing specifically in favor of the group, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which now control about 55 percent of the city of Raqqa. Now, that sounds good, but the military says there's still a lot of difficulties ahead and there's going to be even more difficult in the next months and weeks forward. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby at the Pentagon. Thank you, Wyatt. The unrest continues in Venezuela with violent clashes, shortages of food and inflated prices. Si trovi una soluzione pacifica e democratica alla crisi. The Pope recently expressed his closeness to the country. During an address last month, the Holy Father said he is praying for the beloved nation, and he made an appeal for an end to the violence there. Eliana Loza covers the Vatican and Italy for the Venezuelan paper El Universal. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Pope Francis is asking for a peaceful and democratic solution to the crisis. How important is it that the Holy Father is speaking out about the situation in Venezuela. Oh, it is very important. Venezuela is a very Catholic uh, country, and people, uh, since the beginning of this awful crisis, started even to have a group of prayer. So whatever the Pope says in, in order to uh, support the people is very, very welcome. Of course, politically it has not the same result. The president is not going to listen to anyone. He's just going uh, in, his, in his way to a dictatorship. But the, the, Pope, the support of the Pope is, yes. of course, very important. It for certainly the is. The Vatican has asked the government to suspend the work of the Constituent Assembly, which was elected to draft a new constitution, and many Venezuelans are very critical. They see it as a way to enable this dictatorship of President Maduro. What has been the president's reaction to the Vatican's intervention? Well, uh, Maduro wants to, to make, uh, to give the impression that the, the Pope is, is with him. But he failed to, to mention that the Pope uh, made a statement uh, uh, begging respect of human rights and uh, supporting the people. He met the bishop, the Venezuelan bishop, in a very important meeting uh, a month ago. So, um, you see, uh, he's, he's just, uh, uh, Maduro is, is going in his way to this dictatorship, as I said before, and. Uh, is he will not listen to the Pope or to Cardinal Parolin or to what the church says, unfortunately. Thank you so much for your perspective. Eliana Loza, journalist for El Universal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up, Pope Francis prays for the victims of the Sierra Leone mudslide. Hundreds remain missing. And free Burma Rangers, one group's mission to help those in conflict zones. Pope Francis prays for those who lost loved ones in the massive mudslide in Sierra Leone. In a telegram, the Holy Father says he stands in solidarity with the rescue workers. More than 300 people died. 600 remain missing. One aid worker who makes it his life mission to save other people rescues a girl in an Iraqi war zone. She was hiding under her mother who did not survive. Let's watch as our next guest races into harm's way without a gun. Two or one. Amazing. Joining me now, Dave Eubank, founder of a humanitarian group called Free Burma 
Rangers and his wife is with us. Thank you, Karen, so much you. for joining us. Your children are here. We'll talk to them in just a little bit. But first, Dave, you said it was a Bible verse that gave you the courage to run into that sniper fire. What was going through your mind when you were doing that? Well, the verse is John 15, 13. No greater love has a man than this than he lay down his life for his friends. And that's come to me unbidden when I didn't want to go do something. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God's word. And what was going through my mind behind that tank, we, we, we called the Americans and talked to the Iraqis. They coordinated this smoke. And then we followed an Iraqi tank in to get with the survivors. What was going on my mind was that I thought I was going to die this one. Of course. We, you, it looked like you were going to die. Right. We did seven different kinds of rescues. But this one was like... I think we're going to die, and I thought, you had well, people it, shooting from behind you, and, and I guess and around, people were shooting and, uh, all around you. A at little the bit same later, time. one of my guys was shot. How often do you do this? I, I know that after that, you went in after two more people. Right, we went after two more people that day, and then seven more the next day, and seven more the next day. We had no support from the outside, and this is the most important thing I could say: is God did it, and it was another a reminder to me the power of the praying church. Because I knew I wasn't alone, and I was terrified. And I said, Jesus, help me, and Satan, in Jesus' name, and demons, and ISIS, you can't see or hear us. Because on the second one, which is not this video, we yeah. had to go inside ISIS-controlled area and get and pull more people out, out inside the area. And that was the power of God. So what was going through my mind really was, at that tank, get if the I kid. die, get the kid, <laughs> what would you want if it's your daughter? Uh, right, and, and it then, could have been one of your children who are standing right over here. Let me ask you, Karen. <laughs> I understand you celebrated your 24th wedding anniversary in Mosul, is that right? We did. Yeah, and you helped that girl, that girl yeah. that we saw him rescue. Why do you do this? Oh, God has an incredible call on my life to get to know him better, and that was through meeting Dave, through starting mission work that would go into the conflict zones of Burma with wonderful families that welcomed us to their villages, that welcomed our family, that took care of my children, from small children to high school now. Some of the uncles that raised them as babies wow. are now with them as high schoolers as we go to Burma, as we go to Iraq also. Why don't you bring the kids in? Come on in, kids. And they travel with you to these war zones. This is Peter. They've grown up in them. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm Suzanne. Suzanne. I'm Saheli. And Saheli, tell me why is it important to your family to have them come with you to war zones? Well, we love them, love to be together. And also there's families in every war zone. And so we don't take them to get shot. In this case, in this, during this rescue, for example, I was at the front with some of our Burma medics and our other team members, and the family is about a thousand yards back at a casualty collection point where casualties are brought in or people are fleeing where they can help. So what do you do? Peter, when someone comes in, what do you do? I help my mom when we're on the mission trips with her Good Life Club program that she started for the kids in the war zones. And what is that program? It is a program to give kids tools for their body and their soul. I call it abundant life, body and soul, after the verse John 10:10, 10, 10, where Jesus says, I will give you abundant life. And I felt God say, introduce them to me and I will give them abundant life. And so we do skits and games and songs and just something that fills that day with more inspiration and, and tools for courage, for hope, health care, how to fight diseases that are very common to them. And there's a team of rangers that do it with us. And That's, my kids also join with the kids. And you join too. You know, it is just amazing to me. You are living the gospel, your entire family. And I can't tell you how impressive that is. You know, I'm afraid to put my kids on the metro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming in, for sharing your story and your story and your story and your story and your story. You're doing your story such too. tremendous work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, and God bless you all. God bless and you, God bless too. TV land. <laughs> Everybody who's watching. Yes. Dave Eubank and his wife, founder of Free Burma Rangers. Thank you. Up next, a win in court for pro-life activist David Delayden. And we go to Graceland to remember the king 40 years later. Remembering St. Stephen of Hungary on his feast day, he was the king of Hungary and helped bring Christianity to the country. He died in the year 1038 and became a saint 45 years later, along with his son, St. Emmerich. A bathroom bill in Texas dies for the second time. The bill would have required transgender people to use the bathroom that corresponds with their sex at birth. 
Without another special session, Texas lawmakers won't return to work again until 2019. The governors of Oregon sign into law a bill expanding coverage for abortions. The bill will force taxpayers, including pro-lifers, to assume some of the costs for abortion and other reproductive services. Oregon is the first to add no-cost abortion coverage to state statutes. And a federal appeals court rules Arkansas can block Medicaid funding to Planned Parenthood. This ruling comes as a result of undercover videos recorded by David Delighton. He is a pro-life investigative journalist who says the videos show the abortion provider illegally sells baby tissue for profit. The Republican governor ended the state's Medicaid contract with the organization in 2015 over those videos. And also in court, Delighton has won an appeal against a group of University of Washington research lab employees and abortion clinic personnel. They are seeking a redaction after an investigation by Delighton showing the trafficking of aborted fetal remains. And finally tonight, it has been 40 years since the king of rock and roll left the building. You were always on my mind. Elvis Presley died on this day in 1977. It was of a heart attack and the news shocked fans worldwide. He was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, where our executive producer and I went. We went right to the hardware store where he bought his guitar. He moved to Memphis with his parents, and he went to school there, launched his music career there. Known for his rock and roll, Elvis was also a gospel artist and actor. He is one of the best-selling musicians of all time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was pretty bad, right? <laughs> anyway, that does it for everyone here. For all of us, thank you for watching. To all of you around the world, I'm Lauren Ashburn, and we will be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.